Welcome to the Space Telescope Public Lecture Series. Tonight's talk, Gamma Ray Bursts, Spectacular Explosions from the Distant Past by Giovanna Puliesi uh, from the Anton Pankoek Institute at the University of Amsterdam. I am your host, Dr. Frank Summers from the Office of Public Outreach here at the Space Telescope Science Institute. And as always, I love to thank our wonderful tech team, Thomas Marufu and Grant Justice, who bring you these, uh, these lectures every single month. Next month, on May 7th, Stellar Astronomy in Search of Dark Matter, how you can look at stars and find the dark matter out there. Eduardo Vitral of the Space Telescope Science Institute will bring that talk to you in June. Nicole Arulananthan, from, also from the Space Telescope Science Institute, will talk about web observations of planet formation. This is one of the main science drivers of the Webb Space Telescope uh, planet formation, and she will give you the latest update. In July, the pillars of creation, multi-wavelength and in 3D. That will be me. I will be presenting on our latest three-dimensional visualization, this time of the infamous Pillars of Creation. And I'll have a blast presenting that to you in July. If you want more information, you go to www.stsci.edu slash public hyphen lectures, and you will find this web page. Uh, in the lower left corner, you can see links to our webcasts both on our YouTube playlist and in our webcast archives at STSCI. In the lower right, you can see how to sign up for our email. Enter your email address, hit that subscribe button, and you will get our monthly emails. Also on the website, we have the individual lectures uh, descriptions. And if you click on one of those, you will get the full description of the lecture. Uh, as well as links to the STSEI webcast, as well as the YouTube webcast. As I said, our email announcements, easiest way is just to sign up at our website. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com Hubble Space Telescope. That's all one word, Hubble Space Telescope. And if you, if you click on it, you will get the new video notices, as well as reminders of live events such as this. And finally, if you have comments or questions, you can send them to the email address publiclecture at stsci.edu. Our social media accounts that we run at Space Telescope are for the Hubble Space Telescope, for the Webb Space Telescope, and for our institute on Facebook, X, YouTube, and Instagram. And now the news from the universe for April 2024. And I chose just one topic to discuss with you tonight, the multi-wavelength views of NGC 604. Okay, let's start out at a broad view. All right, this is an amazing image by an astrophotographer named Malcolm Park. I wanna give him great credit for it because it really just, it's evocative to someone like me who knows this part of the sky really well. Up in the upper left-hand corner, is the Andromeda Galaxy, the, the, the nearest large galaxy to our Milky Way. It's also known as Messier 33. In the center is a bright star in the constellation Andromeda called Mirac. And so, and so this is uh, one of the stars that actually you use to help find the Andromeda Galaxy. You go from the Great Square in Pegasus, you count up a couple stars, you get to Mirac and you say, just go over a little bit um, and you find the Andromeda Galaxy on the night sky. But what I love about this image is it reminds me that on the other side of Mirac is another galaxy in our local group. This is the Triangulum Galaxy, also known as Messier 33. So you're transferring from one side of this image is the Andromeda constellation, and on the other side of this image is the Triangulum constellation, and there are nearby galaxies in both of them. And the topic of the story this week is going to be uh, inside Messier 33. So here is an, a view of Messier 33. While the 
while the Milky Way and Andromeda are large spiral galaxies, about 100,000 or a little more than 100,000 light years across, uh, Messier 30 is what we call a medium-sized spiral galaxy. It's about 60,000 light years across. And this is a Hubble mosaic that contains about 1.3 billion pixels. Yeah, 1.3 billion pixels in this really, really large Hubble mosaic of Messier 33. And one of the cool things about it is that you notice in the upper right hand corner, there is this really bright blue region there. And that is NGC 604. It is a nebula. And if I do show you a different Hubble image of that nebula, here is NGC 604 as seen by Hubble with the wide field planetary camera mosaic. Um, you see, oh wow, this is a star forming region. And you, even, you immediately start looking at it going like, okay, this is a nebula in our own Milky Way galaxy that just happens to be projected along the line of sight toward Messier 33. And you would be wrong because it is not. This is a nebula in the galaxy Messier 33, in the Triangulum Galaxy. This nebula is 2.7 million. Yeah. So if I go back to that image, you can see just how big this star forming region is. This is on the outskirts of the Triangulum Galaxy is a huge, huge star forming region that we can see with this kind of clarity and detail from 2.7 million light years away. So this is obviously a target that if you're studying star formation, you want to study this. It kind of reminds me of the, um, uh, uh, the Tarantula Nebula in the Large Magellanic Cloud. It's one of these giant star forming regions inside the local group that we use to study star formation. And so here is what you see in visible light. You can see you can see all the bright, massive stars, and you can also see the what we what we astronomers call warm gas. This is hydrogen gas that's heated to three thousand to ten thousand degrees. Okay, so you've got massive stars and warm gas at uh, thousands of degrees. Webb has now taken a look at this at this region, um, and in the near infrared, Webb's image looks like this. It looks significantly different because you're not seeing the massive stars. You're not seeing the very uh, the biggest stars because they shine mostly at visible and ultraviolet light. The stars that shine primarily at infrared light are the lower mass stars. So you see the lower mass stars and also you see what is called cool dust, dust that's at hundreds of degrees Kelvin. Right? And so you're seeing a different set of dust. It's slightly displaced from where the visible light uh, uh, gas is. And then Webb also has a mid-infrared channel, which goes out to even longer wavelengths. And that you're seeing even cooler dust and seeing very few stars in the mid-infrared. Okay, So going from visible light to near infrared to mid mid infrared shows you three different structures, three different types of structures inside this and uh, inside this nebula. So we they align them and put them together into this animated GIF. And so here we have visible to near infrared to mid infrared, visible to near infrared to mid infrared. And if you watch carefully, you can see the structure actually sort of expanding a little bit because you're seeing gas deep and dust deeper and deeper into the nebula. As you go to lower and lower temperatures, uh, you have the, ga the gas and dust has to be further and further away from those hot stars in the core in order to be glowing at those temperatures. So in the visible, you're seeing the, the, the hot gas. And then in, in near infrared, you're seeing the cool gas that gets a little bit deeper. And in the mid infrared, you're seeing it even a little bit deeper. You sort of like you're sort of watching the, you know, the structure, the skeleton of the nebula grow uh, as you look further and into the dust. And this is one of my favorite things about living in the combined Hubble and Webb era, is that we really get to see high resolution detailed images of objects like this that show us how they look in both in across multiple wavelengths and see different facets of it with each image. All right, our speaker tonight is uh, Giovanna Pugliese. 
Um, and she is from, I'm so I gotta get my, where's that stop button? There it is. Okay. Um, and she's coming to us uh, from the Netherlands, where it's six hours later than it is here in Baltimore. So thank you for staying up and, and giving this talk. It's fantastic. Uh, she got her, she's originally from Italy, and she got her undergraduate degrees at the University of Bologna and at uh, got her master's in Rome and got her PhD in Germany at the University of Bonn and the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy. Uh, then she traveled an awful lot, a, a good amount uh, while doing postdocs, starting out at the uh, University of California, Santa Cruz. That must have been fun. Uh, the European Southern Observatory in Garching in Germany. Um, and then she finally settled on the Netherlands and was at Utrecht University and Radboud University before settling up at the University of Amsterdam. Um, one of the things I noticed while looking, uh, researching her on the internet today was that she has a strong commitment to teaching. She went back and got her master's in teaching. Okay, most astronomers who do research don't, I mean, they, they, they want to do their teaching well, but they don't go back to get a master's in teaching in order to do this. So, uh, real big kudos to you for that. Um, and she tells me that uh, one of the highlights of her life uh, is her three kids. She has uh, two twin boys and a girl, um, and uh, that they are one of the highlights of her life, along with her husband, by the way, who is also an astronomer. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Giovanna Pugliesi. Thank you very much, Frank. It's really a big pleasure to be here for me and uh, to, I start to share my talk. And uh, as I said, it's a really pleasure for me to be here because I can share with uh, a large, uh, large public uh, my passion for astronomy. And uh, I hope that at the end of this talk, uh, uh, people will know a bit more about the gamma bursts, what they are, and how they can be used as an amazing, fantastic tool not only to study uh, the extreme physics of radioactive processes that is emission of very high energy in a really uh, ultra relativistic environments so that is uh, when the matter is moving very close to the speed of light but also as a tool to study uh, the um, the galaxies, the galaxy formation, or the chemical evolution of galaxies uh, are very close to the Big Bang. So, uh, I am not the protagonist of this talk. The protagonists are gamma ray bursts, and uh, I think that uh, is um, just better to start with them, just to show you how they look like in gamma. What are gamma ray bursts? They are just a flash of very high energy in the gamma band that lasts for a very small amount of time. For many, many years, more than 30 years, this is just how gamma ray bursts looked to us. Um, I tell you that on the horizontal axis, you have just the duration of this very bright emission in gamma, and on the horizontal, on the vertical axis, uh, you have the count of photons in the gamma detector. So you have just the energy that is released by this high energy photons in the detector. As, as you can see, I hope that one thing that is just striking you is that there is a large variety of GRBs. I would like to point your attention at the top right. You can see that the duration is just about uh, less than 30 seconds, but then you see that you have a very sharp increase in, uh, in energy, so in emission, and then uh, slightly, very smoothly, it's just a fading. Now, look on the bottom middle, you will see that the duration is just uh, more or less the same, but it is a totally different feature that this GRB this new GRB is showing. So you have multiple peaks that uh, gives the idea that uh, the, the progenitor is acting in a different way. And then the question is, does this depend only on the progenitor? Does it also depend on the way in which uh, the, the, this progenitor was formed or evolved or is interacting with the matter? 
So uh, at the beginning, uh, for as I said, for many years, uh, this is just what uh, we were just wondering. And the reason it is because we could detect them only with the gamma detectors. Now, before telling you more about GRB, I would like to show you this plot, probably many of you saw it already many times, to study gamma rays, we need satellites, because good for us and for our health, because the gamma rays are, you know, they are produced in nuclear reactors, so they are very bad for our health. So our atmosphere, luckily, is filtering them, as you can see, is filtering the gamma, is filtering the X, so to observe gamma rays and X-rays, we need satellites that are above our atmosphere. Then, of course, we have the optical part of the infrared the microwave is also filtered. So we need uh, um, telescopes that are uh, above the atmosphere, and we are really very lucky to have uh, uh, JWST that now is doing great things for us. And then all of the radio instead, uh, they pass through the atmosphere, so we have a lot of radio detectors on Earth. Uh, what is another characteristic of the gamma detection? That for the way in which they are, they, they work with a technique that is called scintillators. I don't go into details. Gamma rays, they don't give us a very detailed position. What does it mean? Uh, it means Means that when we observe in gamma, uh, we have a lot of the portion of the sky. We have arc minutes. Um, and so we cannot say to the telescope on Earth, you know, point there. It is like if I tell you that I have a friend in Rome, but I'm just telling you, okay, lives in Rome, but I cannot tell you in which street this friend is living. So for many years, we just observed the gamma ray burst with. Uh, uh, with the um, gamma telescopes, and uh, what we know was just that they were very bright emission in gamma and short duration. Then, in the 90s, uh, a, another uh, telescope, another satellite with a better resolution was launched, and uh, it started to observe the gamma ray bars continuously. Uh, Why there was some lack of time between uh, the GRBs were discovered in the 70s, and then we started to get the data in the 90s? Well, the reason uh, is uh, a very interesting one, because uh, the GRBs were discovered in the 60s, by some secret satellites. So there were satellites, you know, who were in the middle of the Cold War, and there were these satellites who were monitoring the nuclear explosions, you know, reactions of atomic bombs that other countries were just testing. And the uh, United States was just looking in the sky to see what was going on. And suddenly they started to have all of these emissions in gamma, they were pumping out continuously. And uh, they just realized that there were too many. They were uh, everywhere in the sky, so they just realized they couldn't be terrestrial. They couldn't be really produced on the Earth, but they were astronomical. So for many years, uh, until the 70s, we didn't know almost anything about these GRBs. And then in 73, we knew that the GRB existed. And then, you know, from when you decided to build a telescope until or a satellite, until when the satellite is uh, functioning, uh, takes, of course, takes years. Uh, so our first detection for gamma ray burst uh, astronomical detection was from BATSE, and uh, was uh, it was an instrument on uh, the Compton satellites on in gamma, and uh, gamma the Compton satellites uh, through BATSE gave us uh, three major information about the GRBs. If you look uh, at this image, what is the thing that you know first? You know that GRBs are everywhere. This is just an image of how we see the sky from Earth, all of the sky. As you can see, GRBs are all over the places. We say that they are isotropically distributed in the sky. It means that they don't have a preferential direction. As you can see, they are not clustered in one place. They are all over the places. Another thing that the BATS or detected, observed for us, is that there was a less number of GRBs that were faint compared to the number of GRBs that were brighter. Uh, what does this mean? 
this was a hint, an indication that probably gamma ray bursts were not occurring in our galaxy, but probably they were cosmological. Why? Because if they were on our galaxy, you know, if objects are closer to you, you should also see more faint objects. The further away they are, the less the faint you are detecting. And uh, mm, of course, Batze couldn't say anything anymore because this was just the limitation of what the gamma uh, detector could see. But there was another thing that through the data collected by Batze, we observed. We just observed that gamma ray bursts were just divided according to, ray, to their duration in two groups. There were, as you can see here on the horizontal axis, there is the duration, and on the vertical axis, there is number of all GRBs observed. As you can see, uh, there is a peak, it means that most of the GRBs are either below two seconds or above two seconds. And then, since this was published, we called the one below two seconds the short GRBs, short duration, and the long GRBs, long duration. What does this mean? Well, we could do speculations. Could this mean, could this mean that they are actually two different classes of gamma ray bursts, that they have different progenitors, or they have both different progenitors that they occurred in different environments, so in different galaxies. Well, we needed other satellites. We needed to observe GRBs in other wavelengths at other frequencies that could allow us to have a better position, a better localization of the event. Just to summarize, these are just the main observations that we had from uh, <clears throat> until the 90s. Uh, we know that uh, uh, they were just uh, publicly announced in uh, 1973 that they peak in gamma, that uh, they are, the duration is between a few milliseconds, that is, for example, 0 0.00 one second and up to 1000 seconds that as i show you in the previous plot they have a, they can have a very rapid variability that we detected more or less from all over the skies uh, including short and long gerbis about 1000 gerbis per year 1000 gerbis per year and Batse discovered that they were isotropically distributed and probably they could be cosmolo a cosmological distance now i would like to open a parenthesis because i want to be sure that uh, when i speak to you about the redshift about the cosmological distances and about parsecs uh, we we know what we are speaking so I would like, I hope that this goes, yes. Now, this is just uh, a plot of how we think that uh, our universe evolved from the Big Bang. Now, uh, fix your attention on the bottom part of this um, slide. You have that on the bottom, you have the age of the universe. On the, your, if you look at it, on the right, there is the Big Bang that according to the uh, last cosmological uh, uh, data that we have uh, and uh, theory, uh, we think that it occurred about 13.7 billion years ago. So uh, the fifth Big Bang is zero. We are 13.7 billion years after the Big Bang. And then one way to measure this uh, is through the redshift. The redshift, just to give you an idea, is just the Doppler effect applied to light. And it gave us a very good estimate uh, according to some theory and modeling and observations that is not part of this, are not part of this talk. They give us an idea of the expansion of the universe. This means that we are a redshift zero and the more we go back in time, the more we go closer to the Big Bang, the higher the redshift is. And this is because, of course, as you all know, uh, electromagnetic signal of uh, is light. Photons, uh, they have a finite, a finite speed, uh, that is the speed of light. So light uh, takes time for us to reach. 
Uh, so uh, when I speak, uh, when I'm going to speak about the journeys, I will uh, either yeah, I will tell you about the redshift, and when I tell you about the redshift, is the red, if the redshift is very high, I will give you the uh, time from the big bang, big bang that this uh, event occurred. But if it is a very low redshift, I will give you the distance in parsecs. Now, uh, I don't know how many of you know what a parsec is. Uh, a parsec is a way in which uh, is a unit of distance uh, that we use to measure stellar objects or galaxies, uh, or objects in the universe that are further away from us. Uh, as we do uh, during our daily life, and we do the same uh, in, uh, in astronomy, that is, we use different uh, measurements, different units, uh, according to what we are measuring. I'll, I'll give you a very simple uh, uh, example. If you want to measure the table in your kitchen, you don't use miles or kilometers. You will use either inches or centimeters or feet and meters. Well, we do something very similar uh, in astronomy, but with other units. For our solar system, we use astronomical unit, uh, AU. That is the unit that uh, uh, it gives the distance between us and the sun. It is one AU. Uh, but if we go into our galaxies, or if we want to measure the distance of other galaxies, as you can imagine, the AU is, is very teeny tiny. And um, I would like just to give you a very practical example so you can visualize, I hope, a bit how distant gamma ray bursts are. Now, uh, do you know how far away it is the closest star to our solar system? Because our closest star is the Sun, but the closest star to our solar system is called the Proxima Centauri, and it is a one parsec. Now, imagine that uh, you are at home and you take a step, and uh, taking that step, that corresponds to one AU. So taking that step, you reach the sun. How many steps or how many miles do you have to take to reach Proxima Centauri from your home? What I mean is that if making one step, you just reach the sun. Proxima Centauri is, uh, I don't know, in uh, your uh, living room, or it is uh, next door to your neighbor, or it is to the supermarket closer to you, or the next city. Well, uh, if with one step in your home and you are in New York, you reach the sun, to reach uh, Proxima Centauri, you have to go from New York to Philadelphia. It is about 100 miles. And it's just one person. So with one step, you are at the sun. With 100 miles, you are in another city and you reach Proxima Centauri. Uh, in Europe, uh, consider that if you are in Rome, then uh, to go to Proxima Centauri, you have to reach uh, more or less the north of Naples. That it is uh, 144, 150 kilometers. Uh, so, I hope that now we know when I'm going to speak about distances, how we can just quantify and visualize this. Let's go to the next step. This is just what happened in uh, 1997. Oh, just to clarify, when uh, we name a GRB, there is first the year, then the month in which occurred, and then the day. The day. So this was the first air GRB observed in the optical. It was the 28th of February, 1997. Why we were able to, all, to do all of this? Well, because uh, in 1996, BEPOSACS, that is uh, a satellite in uh, X-rays, uh, a collaboration between Italy and the Netherlands was launched. Uh, why in X-rays? Because in X-rays, eventually, we can have a more narrow position to give to the telescope on Earth and say, look, now it is not anymore arc minutes. I'm giving you arc seconds. It is like if now I'm telling you that my friend not only lives in Rome, but I'm giving you the address of my friend with the street and the civic number. And this is what happens in uh, February 97, Pepo Sachs had got the trigger, he got the position, he took this position and he shared with a lot of different detectors and 
uh, telescopes on, uh, on our planet. Uh, this is uh, a Dutch telescope on Canary Islands. And the telescope now knows where to point and it could observe the first opti optical transient of the GRB. And, uh, and then they saw that it was uh, cosmological because look at here, it was 0 0.69, the redshift, and this corresponds to about 7 billion and 400 years after the Big Bang. So the light really spent uh, uh, more than uh, uh, 6 billion years to reach us. And this was the first amazing evidence, not only that the GRBs are cosmological, so they are not in our galaxy, but they are in other galaxies further away from us, but also that they are emitting energy in gamma, in X-rays, and now they are also in the optical. And that was starting to be interesting because this means that we have something very powerful, very energetic, that still has energy to radiate not only in gamma in X, but still in the optical. And then gamma reversed 97 or 5 or 8 accurate. This is the one of the 8th of May 1997. And this was this NHST image, and this was an amazing uh, uh, proof that the GRBs are. Uh, or cosmological, but not only this. This GRB taught us a lot of things. First of all, you can see that on the left, there was the first image taken by HST. It is in the optical. And then on the right, you see that after a few days, the brightness of the image is starting to fade. But uh, together with this, also, radio telescopes pointed on the direction of this GRB, and they saw for the first time that the GRBs also were emitting in radio. So, at this point, you are starting to have a lot of pieces of puzzle all together. It is very bright, it is very, very energetic. Uh, it has a very short duration and is emitting in so many electromagnetic waves. So what this is? Uh, you have to, to think that, uh, at least I like to think in this way, that uh, uh, in science in general, uh, we have a kind of a tennis match between the theory and observations. Sometimes the theory can make predictions of what later on would good better instrumentations and the evolution of technology we can observe. And this happens all the time with Einstein and the whole what he theorized. And that he did some predictions and then we see, oh wow, that's true, that is the and uh, and then what happens that then when you have the data, you are again launching the ball to the theory, saying, okay, this is something new. Theory can you explain this? Sometimes the theory can, sometimes can't, then we have to tune it. And then it is just going on a, a kind of bouncing between theory and observation just to improve our knowledge of whatever we are researching. In the case of astronomy, of course, astronomers is of course the universe. In the case of GRBs, the prediction was there. It was done in the 80s with something that is called the fireball model. Now, if you go online, you find really a lot of uh, simulations about this. But I will try to, to use my hands to explain. Uh, the idea is the following, that uh, long GRBs are associated with the explosion of supermassive stars. It is masses that it is at least 20, 30 times the mass of the Sun. While the uh, short GRBs are related with the merge of compact objects. At that point, we didn't know if it was a two black holes merging or a black hole and neutral star or a neutral star or with, together with another neutral star. But whatever is the progenitor, either two compact objects or a supermassive star, gamma ray bars are just the fireworks that the universe is launching toward to us saying, hey, look at here, a black hole is born. 
these are what gamma ray bursts. Well, this is what the gamma ray bursts are. They are just the birth of black holes, stellar black holes. Uh, the idea is just the following. L let's focus more on uh, the long GRBs because they are a bit, uh, at least uh, for uh, decades, they were more better studied than the short GRBs. Now, imagine that you have uh, your supermassive star. Uh, you know that uh, uh, it's just starting with wind to spread matter around itself in the uh, hundred uh, thousands of years that uh, is its its life, and then at a certain point uh, the uh, radiative pressure is just uh, uh, not uh, anymore supporting gravity. Gravity is taking over. The core is just shrinking, shrinking, and is collapsing. While this core is collapsing, the idea is that it's forming a black hole in a way in which we cannot yet tell you because this is just something we are work on this is work in progress two jets one opposite to the other are launched so when the black hole is formed two jets are launched these jets what are they are just channels very narrow channels of super relativistic matter and energy and we see the GRB if these channels are just pointing to us uh, to our telescopes. Uh, once uh, these jets are launched, uh, the star is still, uh, the black hole is still there, but the matter is still collapsing, and then it explodes as a supernova, what we call an hypernova. Now, what happens in the jet? Focus on the jet. In the jet, we have uh, is super energetic matter, ultra relativistics, that is the speed of this matter is very close to the speed of light. Then you have what we call shells of matter. Imagine just the, the layers of an onion. So you have these shells of matter that are moving, but sometimes their speed is in a way that one shell is just hitting each other. So you have gamma, gamma, gamma. Then it started to decrease because it started to expand and you have X-rays, X-rays, then this jet, this channel of matter is entering into the circumstellar medium. When it is entering, it's just like when you are entering in a straight with the traffic, you have to decelerate. So you have gamma, gamma X-rays, starting to decelerate, enter into the circumstellar medium, then you have optical, 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 and starting to decelerate, decelerate, emission goes into the radio. Now, I don't know if you could visualize it very well, but uh, you can see also here in the image, I hope that you can see my mouse, because I can, but I hope that you can see it as well. In the part of the jet that is very close to the black hole, there <clears throat> you have the gamma and the X-rays. So the gamma X-rays give us an idea of what happens very close to the progenitor. When you go to the optical, you are not anymore very close to the progenitor. So the analysis of this optical light can tell you a lot about the same interstellar medium, that is the medium around this star, or the evolution of the star. So it can tell us something about the galaxy and the evolution of the galaxy in which occur. And with the radio, we are even further away from the progenitor. So really, we can study the environment close to this massive star at different distances. Uh, I hope that uh, uh, this was just uh, uh, just give you an idea of uh, what we are studying and uh, how we are studying this. Well, of course, with data. Remember that in research, data lead. Whatever the data are saying, we have to take it. We have to, it's not the theory that is saying to the data what they are, but we have to have something that we call, of course, that we have intellectual honesty, that whatever the data are saying, we take it and then we tune and we change the theory when it is necessary. This is why uh, here I wanted to show you, first of all, how and why GRBs are so powerful. See, these are all fantastic HST images. And as you can see, in the, among the four errors, you cannot see almost anything. And HST is the most powerful optical telescopes that we have. And nevertheless, we don't see anything after the GRB faded. So what does this mean that the GRB 
It's just the tool that illuminated this region of the universe in which without the GLB, we wouldn't see anything. So with this data, we are not only studying the GRB itself, what happens in the jet or, or close to the progenitor, but we are also studying the universe in parts of the universe that otherwise were not illuminated. And uh, I think that the best way in which you can see how all this works is uh, showing you one by one the most relevant GRBs and how they guided our knowledge of the um, of the GRB physics and the galaxies in which they occurred that are called the host galaxies. So the first one is the GRB of the 25th of April 1998. Why is this so important? Because first of all, look how close by it is. It was just uh, about uh, 35. 36 uh, million parsecs away from us that uh, from uh, a point of view of uh, of distances uh, is uh, is rather close and uh, the other amazing thing was that this grb was the first one associated with the supernova uh, why it was so important because as i told you previously the theory was saying that you have the two jets and then you have also the supernova that explodes associated with the hypernova associated with the, the GRB. Uh, and the idea is the following, that uh, uh, all the energy that it is in the gamma, of course, is very bright. Uh, it, the one that is occurring in the jet uh, is so bright that it is overtaking everything for days. Then we have to patiently wait that this light is starting to decrease in uh, uh, so we are observing the what we call the, the light curve that is the brightness as you can see here uh, as a function of time so the more the time is passing the more the grb is fading down and if you see pump in the light curve then you know that that is not the grb because the grb is just going down it is the light from the associated supernova and uh, i would like to show you just uh, it is just here this other grb that is the one of the 19th of december 2010 in which uh, that it was further away see it was uh, this time it was at the ratio of 0 0.55 so we arrive of to uh, more a bit more than 80 billion years after the big bang but look in spite of being so further away we can still see uh, you have the grb the, the gamma emission i mean the, the one that is in the jet that is decreasing and then the brightness is decreasing and then you see a bump and that the bump is associated with the relative supernova and this of course was a huge powerful uh, method that we had to confirm that uh, grbs long grbs are associated with the supernova uh, for many years uh, there was just uh, this uh, uh, dichotomy uh, gamma ray bars longer gamma ray bars a supernova uh, and then we started to wonder are all grbs long grbs associated with supernova uh, i will give you the answer in uh, a few slides let's go now to another fantastic grb this is a very very famous why because uh, it was extremely energetic oh uh, this number 2.78 times 10 to the 54 erg to you probably doesn't mean that much. Uh, this is just uh, a, an energy isotopic and it is in all direction emitted by the journey in just uh, 110 seconds. That is uh, here there is a 10 to 54 it means one with the 54 zeros after. But uh, if you now consider that during this whole life that it is 4.5 about 4.5 billion years the sun I repeat, during its whole life, 4.5 billion years, the sun emitted 10 to 51 ergs. You see that in 110 seconds, this GRB emitted 
1,000 times more energy than the sun emitted during its whole life. So these are monsters. These are the most um, powerful uh, explosions in the universe, second only to the Big Bang. And now you have to start thinking that, wow, you have all this energy in such a short time, and uh, how do you model it? And of course, th this was just our free, well, relatively free lab, in which, of course, on Earth we cannot observe these things, we cannot reproduce them. So it was our lab to do radiative processes and try to see which kind of emission process can really produce these observations. And this was such an amazing uh, GRB that uh, if you think that uh, it was if it were in Andromeda, it was not. It was a reddish 1.6. But if this event were in Andromeda, uh, it would have been in the night as bright as the moon. This is just to give you an idea of how much energy was just released. And uh, this is just how the, 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 the light curve that we have so bright in a short time. Uh, this is also another very important uh, gamma ray burst, the one of the uh, 29th of uh, March 2003. Why? Because uh, we observed that this GRB was associated with the supernova, but using a different technique. Before I showed you the light curve, it is the brightness that uh, changed in time, but this gamma ray burst was associated to a supernova using spectroscopy. Just to give you an idea of what the spectroscopy is, a rainbow shows you spectroscopy. You have just the light that enters the atmosphere and with the special meteorological conditions, it's just uh, um, interacting with atoms and molecules in the, the atmosphere. And uh, what you see is just the light that is just uh, divided in its wavelengths. Well, we use the same technique in the universe and I would like just to show you this image. I hope that this can help you a bit to visualize. You have the telescope on the left, you have the GRB on the right, is entering, is entering a region of matter that we call the molecular clouds with the molecules and ions and different atoms. And this light, very energetic, is interacting with these, uh, with these atoms and molecules. So sometimes is stripping away directly an electron, so it is ionizing the atoms or the molecules, or is just making jumping the electrons inside the, the uh, inside the atomic levels of these atoms. And once it does, we have these, uh, what we call the absorption lines. And uh, this kind of features, these absorptions, tell us precisely which atoms this GRB met. So you can see on the left, uh, without being too much into details, on the left you see uh, that we are observing hydrogen, while on the right we are observing uh, um, all of the other, uh, other elements like uh, oxygen, iron, uh, um, nitrogen, uh, and uh, um, zinc, uh, and magnesium, uh, and manganesium, uh, all of the oxygen, all the different elements that are actually formed into the star and spread inside the interstellar medium once the star just exploded. And uh, here we have another very interesting GRB, and uh, this GRB is just uh, very important because it is the only one for which we have a detection of a molecule, of a special molecule. This is carbon monoxide. And uh, up to date, this is the only one in which we could uh, observe it. And we also saw that uh, as such a high redshift, 3.03, we have a very massive star that is also very dusty. And uh, very dusty uh, and uh, gives us also an idea of the star formation rate that is occurring in that galaxy. So we are starting to put all different uh, uh, pieces of the puzzles together. We have the mission, we have the radiative processes, we have molecules, we have atoms around it. We are starting to study galaxies. What else can we do? And what else gamma ray bursts are telling us? 
this is I, I just showing this because probably some of you even saw it because this is the the gamma ray burst that was so amazingly bright that was for a very short period was possible to you know, see it with the naked eye and of course this is very rare especially because it is uh, at a redshift that uh, is not that close by and uh, I have to say that uh, it is not uh, uh, very easy to recognize to reconcile the emission in in gamma with what we have been observing in the optical so this is all what I was telling you about the tennis match in which uh, now the observations are telling us and we have to think carefully how to explain them tuning our theories and of emissions and radiative processes. Now, this is one of the most famous. Why? Because this proved uh, definitively. It was a, a very important proof that we can use GRBs as a cosmological tool. Because look, this GRB was at redshift 9.2. And this means that it was just of 535 million years after the Big Bang. It means that without this GRB, we had no idea whatsoever that there was something there, as you can see in the middle of the image. So we had eliminated a part of the universe that we really want to study. Why? Because the more we go back, time close to the Big Bang, the more we reach the point of the moment in which the first stars were born. And the first stars are, of course, made only mainly of hydrogen and helium. And <clears throat> this gives us also an idea of how the universe was, we call it, uh, reionized. That is how we had uh, photons, electrons, and ions back in the universe. So this was the proof that indeed gamma ray bars can be used as a cosmological tool. Then I want to show you this because this is a GRB in which uh, I worked. Uh, I am part of a very uh, large collaboration in, uh, in Europe, but also uh, in the United States, but also in other countries, in which uh, we uh, take the positions that are given by the satellites of these GRBs and we use uh, telescopes uh, in, uh, in Chile or in other parts of Europe to observe the optical transients of GRBs to study the chemical evolution of galaxies. Now, why are we showing you this? Because this is the only GRB for which we had, uh, at the same time, the spectrum of this GRB as soon as the GRB uh, just uh, exploded. So as soon as we got the data from the satellites, and after five hours, we were observed. And uh, comparing the two uh, spectra, uh, we can have an idea of uh, these, uh, you know, atomic levels, they changed. And so we can uh, say something about the power in the GRB and uh, with uh, a special uh, uh, method that is called the theory of the ultraviolet pumping, we can try to get the distance of the molecular clouds in which these atoms were. Here I can show you, this is what we observed for this GRB. We have aluminium, calcium, iron, magnesium, magnesium, nickel, oxygen, uh, silicon, zinc, and uh, salt and uh, zinc. And we determined that the distance of this cloud at a reddish of 3.5, so no close by, was about 250 parsecs. So really, we can start to study the, the galaxy and the, the uh, the dust and the uh, chemicals that are the atoms that are in uh, around the, uh, the the GRB, so in these galaxies. I'm pretty sure that this is uh, the, you, you know this GRB, because it's one of the most famous and this is a fantastic one. Why? Because this is the GRB that, uh, oh, the one of 17th of August 2017, that put together gravitational waves, uh, neutron star, neutron star mergers, and short GRBs. 
this GRB showed the path for all that at least some short GRBs are in reality related to the merger of compact objects. And how are we sure about this? Because in the moment in which we observe this GRB, uh, LIGO and VIRGO gave us one of the first gravitational waves detectors, depictions. You know, they got the Nobel Prize for this. So we knew, first of all, it was so close by. Look, it was just uh, about 42 million parsecs from us. Uh, so we could study it really in details. So we could know also uh, the uh, progenitors uh, th that they were actually compact objects. And not only that, so we observed that they, they were uh, they were connected with the gravitational waves. There was a merger of two neutron stars, but amazingly, we could see that uh, for short GRBs, we had, when you see the uh, brightness of the object that changes time in the light curve, that there was an excess in the infrared. And this is associated with something that is called a kilonova. Uh, that is uh, I, I, I just, uh, uh, the, let's say that, that is not really true, but, but imagine that if we have the, the supernova for the long term burst, for some of the short gerbies, we have an excess in the infrared. And uh, is this true for uh, only for the short gerbies? I think this is a legitimate question to ask, because at the moment I only told you that the long gerbies, some of them, are associated with the supernova, and now we know that short GRB is a compact object mergers that are associated with the kilonova. Before answering to this question, I want to show you this, that uh, both stays for bright of all times. This was uh, the most majestic and brightest GRB in gamma. And look at there, the energy emitted isotropically was about 10,000 times the energy that the sun emitted during its whole life. So th this was really monster. But uh, what we are trying to understand is that, oh, just focus on the red part, on the red lines. On the left, you have the emission in gamma of these GRBs. The blue points are all the emission in gamma of all the other GRBs. As you can see, th this is just on the top, it's the brightest of all. But uh, on the right, on the other hand, you have the the luminosity in a radio. And this GRB was not that uh, bright in radio. As you can see, many other GRBs were much brighter than this. So how do we reconcile this? How it has this very long afterglows, one of the longest ever observed for uh, really thousands of days. So we have this data. It is so energetic in gamma and then in radio is just uh, a low luminosity GRB. Well, we are uh, there are uh, um, many theories that have been shaken by this, and this is still a work in progress. And um, I want just uh, to conclude uh, this with uh, this is another GRB on which uh, our group is working, and um, this was another rich article in which uh, we showed that there are few, at the moment few, long GRBs that are not associated with supernova, but they have an excess in infrared and they are associated with kilonova. Was that, what does this mean from the theory point of view? Well, it means that some long GRBs are associated also with compact objects. Are they associated with the compact objects in different binary systems. Because one thing that we have always to remember is that in the universe, about 50-60% of all stars uh, are uh, in binaries and sometimes in triple systems. So some, which kind of binary system this can be? This is again a work in progress. And uh, this is my summary. This is uh, just to, to, to remind you that uh, GRBs are a powerful tool to study the 
the formation of the cores, that uh, they are associated with uh, different kinds of galaxies, uh, that uh, some of them are associated with supernova, some associated with kilonova, that they are super energetic, uh, and that uh, uh, for sure some uh, uh, short uh, GRBs uh, also produce uh, gravitational waves. And uh, these are, uh, I conclude uh, with some open questions. And uh, I'm looking forward to listen to your questions. And thank you. All right. Thank you, Vana. This is um, I excellent history of our understanding of GRBs because um, it just shows us how many questions they've brought up, um, how many questions that they've answered somewhat, but, you know, still so many qu some questions still left out there. Um, yeah. This has been a quite a fruitful field over I guess it's about 50 years since we since we we were told that that GRBs existed. Yes, it was in uh, the in the 60s uh, that you know the um, the Vela satellites, uh, the the secret uh, let's call it quotes secret satellites detected that them, and then in the 70s uh, it was this was made public. And then we started to observe, but then, you know, it, it took time because uh, BATSE was only launched at the beginning of the 90s and, and then started to collect the data for, uh, for, a, uh, for, uh, for more than 10 years. Uh, and then we had uh, Beppo Sachs, uh, and then of course we had uh, super fantastic satellites uh, like uh, Swift, uh, like HA, uh, mm -hmm. uh, like Fermi, uh, and uh, our beloved Chandra that we we hope that uh, is continuing to run for for a longer time. Well, I think it also shows our audience that um, if you know the first observation of 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 this existence of something comes in the seventies that it takes decades to develop a satellite and develop something because we can't observe these from the ground. Um, and that, um, that to, to the, it's really kind of cool because you're watching the development of the field and it's in, within my lifetime. So that actually makes it kind of interesting to, to me yeah. that, you know, that this, this whole field has grown up over the course of this. Um, and so one of the things that always quite confused me a little bit, okay, is some of the terminology that has grown up in terms of like kilonova versus hypernova um, <laughs> and such like that. So just for me, who's an astronomer, uh, could you clarify a little bit of that kilonova versus hypernova type stuff? Because it, it, it um, I don't see it often enough to, to keep it straight. <laughs> well, you know, the, the hypernova is a very energetic supernova and it is associated with the uh, with the, the that of a supermassive star, because the, the idea is just to summarize, uh, is that uh, you have a first the the black hole that is formed, then uh, there is uh, the jets, and here we have to admit that uh, we really don't know how these jets are formed. This is a fantastic topic, uh, and uh, simulation still cannot help us very much on this. We know that it's launched, but uh, we don't know how. Then, it, oh, as soon as this is done, you have still all the matter that is collapsing, and then you have the supernova that is exploding. But to do this, you need a very massive star. When you don't have the very massive stars, you have two compact objects. And when you have two compact objects, these compact objects already lost most of their matter because they already exploded in their lifetime uh, as a supernova at a certain point. Otherwise, you wouldn't have the neutron stars. So you don't have that much matter. So you have when they are just, uh, imagine that they are rotating into each other. There are a lot of very good videos about this. They are rotating into each other. They are rotating, but then they are starting to form a disk something that uh, it becomes hard to keep in the other one because with explosion you are destroying it so you have just the disk and you, but you still have the jets and with the less matter than you have that all this is just emitted cooler at the infrared okay um can you stop your screen share Oh, yes, of course. Sorry. No, no, that's all right. Yeah. Um, and now I'm going to invite Grant Justice, um, who is our tech support guy who uh, 
uh, avidly watches the YouTube chat uh, to pull out questions. Uh, Grant, you want to uh, turn on your video and let us know if you found some some fun questions today? Grant? All right. Well, if Grant's not going to uh, going to be there, how about I, I, I have yep. another question or Grant, do you have a question to start with first? No, go ahead and get started. Sorry. Okay. So one of the things I was, um, I've, ne I've never actually um, investigated myself is that, so we know that because these, the distribution is all sky, it doesn't show any preference for our galaxy. So they have to be extra galactic, right? But in terms of the redshift distribution of GRBs, how are how is how, how is that distributed? I mean, I don't I assume that they're isotropic in with red with red with distance. Um, is there a preferred distance at which we see uh, the GRBs? Well, um, I think this is a bit of a tricky question because there is always what we call the selection effect. Right. Because then uh, we have to understand if uh, uh, if we are seeing at the moment that uh, uh, many of them are just uh, picking between uh, that is uh, there is a major number between redshift one and redshift three. Does it mean that really many of them are in this redshift, or it is only because we are uh, tuned? We have the instrumentations that are able to detect many of them. At that distance, because as you can imagine, uh, uh, we are observing a less number of GRBs at very high redshift. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, does this mean that they are less bright, that uh, they are not there, or that we are not capable of detecting? So all this, you know, you have to put everything into account. At the moment, we observe many of them just uh, in, in the redshift that I told you. And uh, if uh, uh, if you want, I can show you the image with the, the redshift distribution. Uh, if you want, I have that image and I can show it to you. Uh, uh, do you think we have time for that or or not? If you if you if you got it right up uh, available, that would be fine. I mean, it's just the there are the different mechanisms that produce them, right? There are certain times that you would, would it would take to produce neutron stars or neutron star collisions yeah. and um, population three stars would they be susceptible to hypernovas more often than you know a later exactly. pop two stars, right? Yeah. Here so. it is. Ah. This is, it is not just the most, most recent, but uh, as you can see, this is the, the one with the blue is just where we would like to study, you know, for cosmological purposes and for galaxy evolution and chemical evolution. But as you can see, they pick a lot of one and then you have between zero, uh, between zero and three, most of it. And uh, the the one uh, in orange are all the ones that we detected uh, with our collaboration. All right, uh, and of course, the further away they are, the the brighter they have to be before we can see them, right? Exactly. So Fact, that's um, yes. uh, all sorts of selection effects, as you said. Yes. Well, cool. All right, Grant. Yeah. How was the chat today? Chat was lively. Um, had people from all over, which I thought was really cool. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, Vanna, you, you brought in a, a good amount of European audience, uh, possibly, oh, really? because, <laughs> possibly because we're doing this earlier in the day. Yes, exactly. yes. <laughs> yeah, it's not if the middle do, of the if night. If you do it at 8 o'clock Eastern time in the U.S., it's after midnight. And so yes, I can exactly. understand why we don't get many European viewers then. Yes, exactly. <laughs> All right, so I'll get us started here. Um, have any ice cube observations been correlated with a GRB? Oh, this is a great question. Thank you, whoever you are for this question. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, the, the reason is that uh, I started as an astroparticle physicist uh, when astroparticle physics was not a thing. You know, I'm speaking of the 90s and uh, I was studying the neutrinos so in an underground uh, observatory in Italy. So the, my PhD thesis was trying to correlate cosmic rays and neutrinos with GRBs. And the answer is no. 
uh, at the moment. <laughs> well, uh, I have to say that uh, uh, um, egoistically, I'm a bit pleased because with my PhD thesis, I said that the principal GRBs should not be uh, the major uh, uh, sources of neutrinos in the universe. Oh, and so far, this connection was not found, but we found the connections of the extragalactic uh, neutrinos with, uh, you know, powerful AGNs. So um, the point is that in the GRBs, you, have, you are accelerating electrons very much, but you don't have to forget that together with the electrons, you are also having protons. You are accelerating protons as well, but the protons are 1,000 more massive than electrons, so you can accelerate them as much as you want, but then they will lose much more energy, much more easier. And then you you know that uh, oh, to get in, in this big amount of particles, there are also the neutrons. And the neutrons, then they are very fast decayed into protons. You emit neutrinos, but in all this, if they lose energy very fast, then at that point you have the neutrinos, but probably they are not as energetic as we thought. Okay. This could this is one of the interpretations, but you know there is uh, a lot going on. There is a lot of uh, very exciting physics uh, in, right. in this field. And I, I guess we should just state for our audience who don't know what Ice Cube is uh, that Ice Cube is this neutrino detector that's down at the South Pole. Yeah. Uh, we, we actually we did have a talk in this series, so if you don't know about Ice Cube, go back in our public lecture series uh, playlist, and you'll find a talk about Ice Cube that talks about uh, detecting ne neutrinos at the South Pole. Okay. It is in uh, you know very deep in the ice. It's an amazing uh, technology advancement. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. All right. What else we got, Grant? So um, this will be a two-parter, and I think. The answer is already known, but I would like the context from you as the subject matter <laughs> expert. Um, so, one, what was the cause of the gamma ray burst that was first observed? Um, GRB 221009A is what you mentioned. And secondarily, have you seen a gamma ray burst that has come from an unusual source or something that you weren't expecting? Well, uh, the first question was that what was the progenitor of that GRB? Uh, well, we think that uh, it was uh, a supermassive star. It was a long GRB. Uh, we don't have anything that uh, is uh, giving us any different indication, but we have also to consider that uh, in uh, 1997, uh, we didn't have all of the amazing detectors that we have now. We didn't have all of the amazing satellites that uh, could have done uh, that thorough analysis that instead we are doing now. Oh, about your, I hope that I answered the first part. About the second part, uh, there are some of the GRBs that I showed you. Uh, they have a lot of uh, pieces of the puzzle that uh, are not there. I mean, if you consider the, the GRB in which you have a very, very bright gamma, and then you don't have the, the same brightness in the radio, uh, you have to think what happened to the matter after a while. You have also to consider that, uh, as I was saying, uh, some of uh, the um, GRBs could really be associated with the binary systems. And there are a lot of theoretical works that are done with this. I'm speaking of long GRBs. The, the problem there is that uh, it is almost impossible, considering the distance at which they are, to disangle it, uh, the binary system from a very massive star. We don't have yet, you know, a prediction, a theory that says, if it is a binary system, this is how it should look like. Right. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, with all of the first image that I showed you, this is what we would love to do it. You know, that, that would be uh, the Rosetta Stone for us. If at a certain point we know this is the gamma, these are the peaks, this is the shape, and this means this progenitor. 
this is my dream, this is how I would like to do. But, uh, you know, many people work it in this, but uh, uh, it, it, at the moment it's not very easy. It is not easy right. at all. And in contrast, we actually have a very good idea of what a supernova should look like, right? Yes. The light curve and, and the fall off from that and how that fades away. So, I mean, that's sort of like the example at which we'd love to be able to have that for all these other uh, events. But uh, if I may say one thing, uh, for the supernova, we know all of this because they occur in our galaxy. So they are close by, so we can really easily to reproduce and we have been observing them for decades, but we don't have this privilege with the GRBs <laughs> because, okay, luckily for us, they are far away because, you know, a GRB close by that is pointing at you, you know, I would prefer to not have. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other thing that, you know, your talk reminded me of is uh, the development of the transient follow-up. Uh, network of things. So, I mean, uh, the just the whole development of hey, uh, here we we've got it, we've got it, we've got a GRB. Quickly turn turn the telescopes to be able to find them. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Because that obviously transformed the ability to do multi wavelength observations of GRBs. Well, absolutely. You know, uh, everything started when uh, Swift went on orbit, and uh, we had also. Oh, Chandra, who was there, uh, and then uh, they start. Um, uh, it was just not the end of the collaboration. At the point, it was called the, the ex shooter collaboration. There were a lot of astronomers from Europe and from the United States, and they did this kind of collaboration in which, oh, uh, now that I'm part time, also on shift. Imagine it happens in this way. Oh, uh, some of us are weekly on shift. We just uh, I am on shift. To two, three times a year. So in that week, I am just on call day and night. I'm always with my cell phone and the app on the cell phone that is telling me, look, there is this GRB and this GRB has these features that belong to the group of GRBs that we decided to observe. So they are just in, the, uh, in what we selected. It has to have uh, just a small amount of dust, or it has to be bright enough, it has to be visible from Chile because we use the telescope in Chile. And as long, uh, as soon as these parameters, you know, they are ticked, then uh, we have a program because we applied, you know, we applied to have time. So we made a proposal, we explained what we got, and we got uh, during all these years. I publicly thank ESO to give us time. That was fantastic. Thank you so very much. And then we get uh, just uh, the possibility to contact people in Paranal in Chile and say, look, uh, uh, is the telescope available with uh, this instrument uh, to observe this uh, telescope either with the photometry uh, in, uh, in optical or in infrared uh, or with X shooter in, uh, we want the spectrum from this. And at the same time, if, some, if something is real exceptional, like for the boat, then uh, we just are in contact with each other also in the night. And then we say, okay, let's put that uh, at DDT, that is a discretional time application, right. either mm -hmm. to China or to HST or to JWST. And uh, I, I have to thank also NASA because uh, we've been very generous with us because uh, we we could uh, just get the data. Also lately, we got the data on, on another job. I cannot speak about that job, but uh, yeah, you know, it's, um, it's exciting. And in a certain way, you know, you feel also privileged and honored because uh, we do what uh, we like. And we have the honor to use all this amazing, you know, technology. Right. And these targets of opportunity, you know, I mean, there's be building up the networks between astronomers and observatories. So yes. these targets of opportunity can be, can be observed relatively quickly. I mean, yes. you, you know, the Hubble time and web time and, and Chandra time is very, very valuable, um, but they always have these targets of opportunity possibilities. That, yes. Um, can and can the, come in then. And the deal is that uh, once it is approved, of course, we don't have any priority time. It belongs to everybody. Right. The, right. As so it has to be. Everything becomes public. That's one of the- Absolutely. Very, absolutely. Immediately without any proprietary period. Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, this is as it has to be. Yeah. 
Great, great. Scientist's best friend, a scheduler's worst nightmare. Exactly. <laughs> oh, yes, in fact, yes. <laughs> uh, all right, Grant, all right. we have another question on the on the chat? Yeah, absolutely. Um, have you observed any gravitational lensing of a GRB? Ah. Oh, this is a very interesting question because there was... A, Honestly, I don't remember which GRB, but uh, we thought that uh, that GRB could be actually associated with the gravitational lensing because we could see that there were a bit of strange shapes with the different galaxies uh, around it, but then we reobserved it. Uh, because if it is gravitational uh, lens, it should be there. We reobserved it and then it was not there. So, you know, you, you can have your idea, you can have your observation, your your theories, but then you have to do it thoroughly through it. And then you have to be, of course, intellectually honest to do a follow up observations to either confirm or disprove it. But at the moment, uh, in my knowledge, I don't recall any GRB associated with the gravitational lens. Um, it, I guess it would be hard to prove because yeah. it's a transient event. It happens and then yes. it's over and you can go look at that field and study it and say, well, maybe there could have been gravitational lensing here, but yes. you don't know where the caustics are that would produce it. So it's. And yeah. and then you, you need to have a, a, a really a, a, um, something that is magnifying very big in front of it. Yep. And uh, so the, there should be a lot of uh, coincidental factors. Right. I mean, statistically, you can say that some of these GRBs are amplified by gravitational lensing, but you can't point at any one and say that one is one that was to done it. Exactly. Oh. Yeah. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Nice question. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions. Are you, Grant? Nope. The Great. Are dry. Right. We've had a wonderful conversation here. Uh, we've learned <laughs> the com almost the com almost the complete hit. Really, we've learned the complete history of GRBs here because it really is a 50 year uh, field, which is wonderful to be able to sort of compact it down into a, into a single talk. So thank you for highlighting all those very important GRBs that happened over, over the years. Um, look Thanks forward to, to for having me here. Uh, I look forward to seeing uh, where we go from here, um, yes. where we will go with this speaking lecture series is that next month, May 7th, Stellar Astronomy in Search of Dark Matter. We hope to see you here for it. Thank you all and have a great day. Thank you, bye.